The representation of black women in anime has historically been limited, but there actually has been a lot of progress over the years. Anime as a medium originates in Japan and often reflects the cultural and ethnic features of not only its creators, but its audience. Anime Today now has a global audience and the growing awareness, importance, and progress of diversity and inclusion is on the rise. There are so many black content creators, black celebrities, and just black people in general who are ingrained in the anime community and rep anime big time. I'm one of those people. <laughs> it's only natural that sometimes we wanna see ourselves in the entertainment that we love. Welcome to the Nerdy Magical Girl podcast. And today we are discussing representation of black women in anime. Before we get started, I want to preface this discussion with a few things. I will be discussing canon and headcanon depictions of black women in anime and manga. If that rattles you in some kind of way, please take this time to respectfully click away. See you next time or see you never. <laughs> anime, while the vast majority is created and written by non-black people, like obviously, because duh, it comes from Japan. Anime itself has a global audience. Many manga authors include darker skinned individuals in their anime for various reasons, whether that be diversity in characters, a shock factor, or because that is what their character and the background of that character demands based on history and place of origin. And listen, I understand that black people, black women are not a monolith. Maybe that's not something that you wanna see in anime, and that is okay. It's also okay not the young people's young who want to see that. I love the saying, don't yuck my yum, because like literally, like just let people enjoy things or let people want the things that they want, even if it never happens. Don't yuck people's yum, period. <laughs> I also wanna preface that these characters, when it comes to English dubbing, majority of these characters are not voiced by darker skinned individuals or black individuals. The voice acting industry I am learning is incredibly gatekept and extremely hard for black voice actors to break into. However, I will be highlighting some of my favorite black women voice actors in this episode and also with bonus content to follow. Third preface, this is a space for fun and a shared love of anime. So let's not be cruel to one another. Let's have fun and let's learn things together. Even if the things that we have to learn are a little painful. And hopefully you'll learn about some new anime that you haven't seen before or voice actors you've never heard of before and maybe you'll check them out. So without further ado, let's kick things off in 1985 with Claudia Grant of Robotech. Robotech is about an alien spacecraft that crash land into Earth and its technologies and secrets lead to intergalactic wars. Storyline spans three generations as mankind fight three destructive Robotech wars. Now, Robotech is an American science fiction franchise that is inspired by the following Japanese anime series. Super Dimension Fortress May Cross, Super Dimension Calvary Southern Cross, and Genesis Climber Mospita. Claudia Grant enters the war as Bridge Officer SDF-1, which is a space warship for all intents and purposes. Claudia Grant is from Wyoming and is a confident leader with a calm demeanor. And while her appearance in the show was only for like a short five episodes, it was really cool to see a black woman represented in an anime adjacent show. She's also voiced by the legendary Iona Morris. Now I already know know what you're going to say, Robotech is not anime, and you are correct. It is not anime. It is an American animated television series that is inspired by anime, particularly the three anime series I mentioned before, which is a well-known fact. It's well known that Robotech is an adaptation of those three anime. But Claudia Grant's impact on anime is there, and its cult following is global. Listen, have you ever met a Robotech fan? And how long did they talk your face off about Robotech? Don't worry, I'll wait. <laughs> you can watch Robotech on Crunchyroll and Amazon Prime Video. Nadia, The Secret of Blue Water in 1990. Nadia, The Secret of Blue Water takes place in 1889 in an alternative steampunk type universe that centers on 14 year old Nadia, who is an acrobat whose origins are Atlantean and a young French inventor named Jean. They take off on an adventure to save the world from an imposing threat. And throughout the journey, Nadia and Jean are chased by militant groups, jewel thieves who seek the blue 
jewel pendant that Nadia wears around her neck, and the jewel itself is called Blue Water. According to Elizabeth Whaley, author of Black Women in Sequins, Rethinking Comics, Graphic Novels, and Anime, Nadia, The Secret of Blue Water is the first Japanese-produced anime series to feature a young girl of African descent. In the anime, Nadia discovers that she is of Atlantean descent, and so much more. Like, her background is so cool. Now, a French inventor partnering with a brown, dark-skinned Atlantean woman to stop a militant imposing power while wearing a magical jewel. Does that sound familiar to anyone else? Maybe a movie that came out way later, way after Nadia, The Secret of Blue Water? Hmm. I guess we'll never know. <laughs> You can watch Nadia, The Secret of Blue Water on Amazon, but it does require an additional subscription in addition to Amazon Prime. So good luck with that. Caldina, Magic Knight Ray Earth. 1993. Magic Knight Re-Earth is a magical girl series that focuses on three girls, Hikaru, Umi, and Fu, who are from three different schools, but on a trip to Tokyo Tower, they are transported to an alternative magical world of Sephiro. They are tasked with the mission to become magical warriors and to rescue the captured Princess Emirate. Kaldina is an assassin hired to take out the Magic Knights and is drawn as a dark-skinned woman with blue eyes and long pink hair. She is a dancer with the power Power of illusions, and she can also temporarily control people's minds and their bodies. In the English dub, she is voiced with like a deep Southern accent, but also fun fact in the subbed version of this anime, she speaks with an Osaka accent. You can watch Magical Night Re-Earth today on Crunchyroll. Casca from Berserk. 1997. Berserk follows the black swordsman Guts on his quest for revenge. There are many who stand in the way of his quest. Heck, even the quest itself is chipping away at his life. But despite all that he faces, Guts forges on and fights all of his enemies. Casca is extremely skilled in swordsmanship, who is pushed into leadership of the band of Falcon after Guts left and another comrade is in prison. Casca goes through some pretty traumatic things in her life. Things, if I mentioned in detail, would probably get this video taken down. <laughs> but she is left with a lot of trauma, PTSD, amnesia, and suffers from crippling anxiety attacks. Now, in any form of media, that is a very stereotypical way to represent a dark-skinned Black woman, no matter the medium, whether that's animation, live action, whatever. But with Casca, the way her mental illness and trauma is depicted seems to be more in line with how often mental illness actually may present in Black women. According to Dr. Angela Neal Barnett, who wrote an article for the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, that Black women with anxiety and depression tend to have more chronic symptoms, and those symptoms also tend to be more intense when compared in studies with our white counterparts. There is this amazing breakdown of Casca's characterization done about six years ago by this YouTuber named Alexander. I will link that video in the description. While he does not speak specifically about black women and mental health, he outlines Casca's story and trauma and how she deals or doesn't deal with a lot that happens to her in her life. When looking at the Berserk guidebook, creator Kentaro Miura stated that Casca was conceptualized as his ideal woman, a brown female warrior who's revered for her strength, superior abilities as a warrior, and also as a great leader and somebody who is also feminine and attractive. That sounds a little fetishy and strong black woman-esque, but okay. I also don't think that he met all the trauma and mental health issues that sometimes come with being a black woman, but you know what, Kentaro, if you like it, I love it, sweetheart. <laughs> I do have to mention that there are some works where Casca's skin is noticeably lighter, um, which is a bit concerning. Not even a bit, it's very concerning. And I've mentioned this before, but the lightening of dark skin characters in anime, cartoons, whatever the case may be, is a deep dive all on its own. Colorism is very harmful and very cruel, and it's not something that I will probably deep dive on because it's just just so harmful and triggering for me personally. But I do want to reiterate that Mira described and illustrated Casca as brown, as dark skin. So maybe we should keep it that way. Anywho, Berserk can be watched on Crunchyroll. Anthe Himamiya, Revolutionary Girl Utena, 1997. Revolutionary Girl Utena follows the story of Utena Tenjo, who after an encounter with a prince, vows to become a prince one day herself. 
While attending the exclusive boarding school, she competes in a sword dueling tournament whose prize is the hand of student Anthihimamiya, who is in possession of a mysterious power. That power is housing the sword of Dios in her body. Utna is determined to win the tournament and to become Anthi's fiance in order to protect those who seek to use her power for selfish gain. Revolutionary Girl Utna depicts many lesbian and queer relationships, plays on gender throughout the series, and has a dark skin main character. Anthihimamiya is unambiguously dark skinned, and I have a particular love in my heart for seeing dark skin girl representation. She is often thought of as docile, having no personality, or rather having like the personality of a doormat, <laughs> which isn't really true because when you get to hear her inner thoughts, her inner thoughts are actually very dark and very vengeful. Um, which, you know, makes sense considering her story and how everybody is usually out to use her, except for Utena, of course. And also because of the abuse and the bullying that she is subjected to throughout all of her life. But that changes, obviously, when she meets Utena. You see the side of her that is softer, that loves animals, that loves playing the piano and eating shaved ice and just being a normal girl. But unfortunately, again, in the film Revolutionary Girl Utena, Adolescence of Utena, Anthe's skin, once again, is noticeable noticeably made lighter and her hair is completely straightened, which is like super disappointing. Colorism strikes again. It's just so sad to see. <laughs> Revolutionary Girl Utena can be watched on Crunchyroll. Coffee from Cowboy Bebop 1998. If any of you make fun of my Jersey accent for how I say coffee, I will fight you. <laughs> I swear to God, <laughs> leave me alone. <laughs> Cowboy Beef Bop is a neo space western that follows the crew of Spike Spiegel, Jet Black, Edward, and Ayn, a genetically engineered corgi with heightened intelligence, with one of the best soundtracks known to all of anime. Coffee was born on Earth and is a bounty hunter. Her weapon of choice is a grenade launcher, and, and actually, her character design was inspired by Pam Grier's character nurse flower child, Coffee Coffin, from the 1970s film Coffee. Coffee has dark brown skin, wears her hair in an afro and wears a cool leather jacket dress, gold hoops, of course, and pulls the whole look together with red heels. They better be Jimmy Choo's girl. She is a true badass. <laughs> Cowboy Bebop is available on Crunchyroll. Canary, Hunter Hunter, 1998. Hunter Hunter centers on a young boy named Gon Freaks who sets out on an adventure to fulfill his dreams of becoming a legendary hunter like his deadbeat dad, Jin. <laughs> sucks. <laughs> Along the way, Gon meets Karapika, Leorio, and Kilawa Zolduk, who become not only his comrades, but his most trusted friends. His best friend being Kilawa. We meet Canary on a mission where Gon actually sets out to save Kilawa. Canary works for the Zolduk family as an apprentice butler and is a ruthless guardian. Canary is kind-hearted, a strong fighter, and is very loyal to the Zolduk family, but particularly loyal to Kilawa. When Canary was only 10 years old, Old, she took down a blacklist hunter and all 100 of his henchmen. The girl is a badass, okay? <laughs> Canary wears her natural hair in a sort of plait hairdo, is a darker skinned girly, and as an apprentice butler, she wears a full black suit as a uniform. While her appearance in the show was brief, her presence was mighty. When I saw her, I literally told my friends and my mom, I was like, yo, like, they had a character in an anime that looks like me, like her hair is like mine, you know, that, that was, it was, I remember that moment, it was really dope. <laughs> Hunter Hunter is available to watch on Crunchyroll, Hulu, and Netflix. Yoroichi from Bleach. 2004. Bleach follows the story of Ichigo Kurosaki when after a chance encounter with a soul eater, he becomes one himself and his life is changed forever. We meet Yodoichi in her black cat form and she's using a very like deep masculine-esque voice, but eventually she reveals herself to be a woman and also that's not her voice at all. <laughs> Yodoichi is brown skin with golden eyes and purple hair, but in the manga, her hair is actually black. She is strong, she is intelligent, she is witty, decisive, and a very caring leader. There is so much history and background to Yoroichi that makes her such a great and well-rounded character. And I highly encourage you to take the time to watch Bleach if you have not already. I started Bleach about two years ago and fell in love almost instantly. Yoroichi also, when she came onto the scene, like became my instant favorite character. Like, hello, I'm like wearing her shirt. <laughs> Bleach is a bit on the long side, but I promise you it's so good. And if you don't like filler episodes, there are many guides online and also like Reddit threads to help you skip the episodes that are not pertinent to the main plot. Bleach is available to watch on Hulu. April, Darker Than Black, 
2007. Darker Than Black takes place in a modern day Tokyo, but this version of Tokyo is home to something known as Hell's Gate. There's this very weird supernatural event that causes Hell's Gate to open. And from this incident, certain individuals actually gain supernatural abilities. And individuals who have abilities are called contractors. April is one of these contractors. There isn't much known about April's background. She does work very well with her comrades, November 11th and July. She has dark brown skin and periwinkle-ish colored hair, golden eyes, and wears a cool tone pink lipstick, probably made by Fenty Beauty, obviously. <laughs> we do know that she likes alcohol. She is an extremely heavy drinker. She has the ability to create hurricane weather conditions. And if she concentrates and with like extreme precision can create a sphere of water around a person's head and drown them. Darker Than Black is a great anime, but it's so hard to find via legal ways to watch anime if that's still your thing. Like you can pay for it if you want to on YouTube. Like, you know, if that's something that you really wanna do. But with the way that rights and usage is like going downhill with digital media, I personally wouldn't recommend doing that. If you do find it though, help a sister out. I watched Darker Than Black years ago and for the life of me, I don't really remember where I watched it. Atsuko Jackson, Rita Ozetti, and Michiko Melandro from Michiko and Hatchin, 2008. Chico and Hatchin takes place in a fictional South American country. Michiko Melandro is a criminal who is serving time in a heavily guarded prison. But when she hears that her former lover's daughter is in an abusive foster home, she escapes said heavily guarded prison and goes to kidnap her. Michiko is described as an Afro-Brazilian woman. She has brown skin, gray eyes, and has straight, long, dark brown hair. Atsuko Jackson actually lived in the same orphanage as Michiko, who whose life went in a completely different direction. She is actually a policewoman and is one of the police officers assigned to actually hunt down Machiko. It's also theorized, but like kind of low key obvious that Asuko's design was inspired by the 70s movie icon, Foxy Brown, because period, like who didn't want to be her? <laughs> Atsuko is a tall, slender woman with dark brown skin and her hair is a natural light blonde. She styles into an Afro. When Atsuko was younger, she actually styled her hair into two Afro puffs. <laughs> when my hair is in a natural state, that's actually like my favorite hairstyle to do with the Afro puffs. It's like my favorite thing. Rita Ozetti makes her appearance in the episode entitled Chocolate Girl in Love. Abandoned at birth at a circus, Rita was raised, loved, and very well cared for by the circus troupe. She has a crush on her performance partner, Gino, and enjoys wearing a lot of jewelry. Despite just being 10 years old, she is very confident in herself and she is very independent, which is more likely a result of her growing up in show business. She has a deep, dark complexion and has shoulder length brown hair, which she styles in cornrows. And seeing cornrows styled on a black little girl in an anime is so heartwarming. Now I can go on for it ever about this show because there is so much black representation, but particularly black women representation. I encourage you to check it out. The Chico and Hatchin is available on Crunchyroll. Miyuki Ayukawa. Basquash, 2009. Basquash takes place in a futuristic world where the most popular sport is Bigfoot basketball, or BFB for short. It combines playing basketball while riding these very large mechs known as Bigfoot. Dan JD, the story's protagonist, dislikes BFB a lot because of an accident that caused his little sister to lose her legs. Dan JD actually goes around town being a menace. He vandalizes the town, destroys property, smashes TVs. But then, as if it's divine fate, Miyuki Ayukawa, his childhood sweetheart, re enters his life and actually shows him the wonders of BFB and instills the burning passion in him to create his own team. Miyuki becomes the team mechanic of Team Basquash as she is a brilliant engineer. She has a dark complexion, magenta eyes, dark curly hair worn in dreadlocks that she keeps tied up into two twin tails that are tied up with pink ribbons. Like, her design is so cute. Did I mention that she is? the team mechanic and that she is brilliant. Miyuki is so cool. And I also love that she's the protagonist, like childhood sweetheart. More dark skinned black girls in non-traumatic love stories, please. That's an all form of media, just all of it. <laughs> More of that, please, Mwah. chef's kiss. 
Now, I will say that this anime has received very mixed reviews over the years because of its writing. But if you would like to check it out for yourself, you can on High Dive. Sister Crone, The Promised Neverland, 2016. The Promised Neverland is an anime with only one season, only one, but has incredible writing as far as the manga goes. For those who have not seen this anime, I will not spoil much for you about the plot because when I first watched it, I had nothing spoiled for me. I was horrified yet engrossed in the plot and the premise of the show. The year is 2045, and it's been over a thousand years after an agreement called The Promise was made to end a long war between the humans and the demons. The plot centers on a mother who takes care of children in an orphanage, and although not bound by blood, for the most part, their bond and happiness is abundant within the orphanage, until one day it's not. Sister Crone is a character who helps run the orphanage, and in my opinion, is a character riddled in racial stereotypes from her background, to her role in the orphanage, to her characterization, and to her looks. Sister Crone, to me, serves as a reminder that minstrelsy in the media, whether it's within the United States or internationally, when it comes to representation of Black people that is often created by non-Black people, is alive and well. This is not the time to comment or infantilize folks who have access to Megan Thee Stallion's internet, who know where to look when it comes to mimicking fun aspects of black culture to co-opt or profit off of, or who sometimes admit out loud that they don't want black people to be a part of their fantasy. Unfortunately, anti-blackness is a language that is understood at a global level. We see this on the news, in media, and we see it in colorism and the avoidance of not wanting to become dark and the multi-billion dollar industries that are dedicated to lightness and whiteness. Lack of exposure and ignorance is an excuse that can only go so far. Because in the case of Sister Crone, the parallels to minstrelsy overlap way too much to feign ignorance to not know its source. The racial stereotypes and menstrual characteristics that Sister Crone exhibits are weaponized as horror elements that feed into very dangerous and honestly tired tropes about Black women. Sister Crone is supposed to be scary, abrasive, undesirable, tragic, and the direct antithesis to Isabella, the mother figure of the story. Her character just made me feel a bit sad and a bit disappointed, con especially considering how amazing the writing is in The Promised Neverland, in the manga, and in season one, just besides this one character. <laughs> it is 2024, y'all. Claiming ignorance is as old and tired as minstrelsy in any form of media. But for argument's sake, let's say that ignorance is truly the case. Then staying ignorant is completely unacceptable. Sister Crone's characterization fell on lazy, outdated, and harmful tropes. If you actually want a concise and informative history on minstrelsy in media and its appearances in modern media, I strongly recommend checking out Dara Star Tucker's The Breakdown on that very topic. I love, although it's very, very brief, when we get to see Sister Crone's softer side, her desire to want to be a mother and eventually have her own orphanage and, and see how hard she works to get to where she is and where she wants to go. It sucks though, no matter how hard she works, plays by the rules, breaks the rules, she will never compare to the beauty standard, the grace and effortlessness and all the things that Isabella is. It's like if you're a dark skinned black girl that grew up in the suburbs or went to a PDWI, that is a particular hurt that is not put into an anime or any form of media by accident or from a place of ignorance. It's intentional. Sister Crohn's has ambitions and dreams and will literally stop at nothing to get what she wants. I just wish that she had been given a fair shot. I need you to remember this before you angrily type things in the comment section. You can like something, love something, and also fairly criticize it. And growth is realizing that not everything that you love or engage in, especially when it comes to entertainment, is without flaws. I just wonder if Sister Crone wasn't black or dark skinned, if these same choices that were made to villainize her character would have been used. Probably not. So now that we know better, let's be better. That was a little heavy. So I want to leave this section on a lighter note. The music in The Promised Neverland is actually really, really, really beautiful. Specifically, I love Isabella's lullaby. I actually use that song as vocal warmups before I do any speaking engagement, recording of a podcast, or actually any singing engagement. I know if there's any vocal coaches out there, they'd be like, why would you do that? Just do some scales. Let's sing. 
sing the song very beautiful in a melancholy kind of way. Plus, there's a bunch of scales and jumps in that song. That's an easy warm-up song. Chill out. The Promised Neverland is available to watch on Crunchyroll. Carol Stanley, Carol and Tuesday. 2019. Carol and Tuesday is about two girls from two very different backgrounds who share a love and passion for music. Carol Stanley is one of the leading ladies of this duo who is an aspiring musician who plays the piano. While Carol's personality falls in line with many aspects of the strong black woman stereotype from being very independent and not needing to rely on anyone and has a very hardened type of exterior that was somewhat born of trauma, you actually get to see through all of that her journey that she is very determined very smart and very talented and a quick-witted individual. Carol and Tuesday is a very, very touching anime and you can watch it today on Netflix. Hi, it's editing me here in the future. I am so ashamed of myself because I forgot an iconic black woman in anime, so much so that I had to throw on a face of makeup and record this for you all. And that person is Nessa from Pokemon. 2019. Nessa first made her appearance in the game Pokemon Sword and Shield in 2019 and in an original prequel animation called Pokemon Twilight Wings in early 2020. I do not know for the life of me why people do not register that Pokemon is an anime. Maybe it stems from the stigma that still surrounds being called an anime fan. That stigma still does exist to this day. Perhaps it's because of the look of Pokemon or wanting to differentiate the games from the anime. I have no idea. Maybe it's all of those things. Maybe it's something else completely. But please know that Pokemon is an anime. It is a Japanese animation television series that premiered all the way back in 1997. Nessa is a model and gym leader of the Holberry Gym that specializes in water type Pokemon. After being defeated, she actually begins to wonder if her modeling career is serving kind of as a distraction from her duties as being a gym leader. Eventually, she begins to work hard to not only be the best model she can be, but also be revered as one of the best gym leaders out there. I strongly recommend that everyone watch Pokemon Twilight Wings, specifically the episode entitled Early Evening Waves, which centers on Nessa. Nessa is amazing, and I actually cosplayed Nessa last year, I believe, and she is one of my favorite cosplays to date. It was Nessa's cosplay where I actually learned how to use lighting better for my skin tone and photography when it comes to indoor cosplays, because typically I cosplay outside. <laughs> my dream is to redo my Nessa cosplay, but do it under water. How am I going to pull that off? I have no idea. <laughs> but Nessa is amazing and I had to show my girl some love. Dorothy, the Great Pretender, 2020. Makoto Edamura believes himself to be the greatest swindler and on an attempt to swindle a Frenchman, he actually ends up being swindled himself. That Frenchman turns out to be a high level con man named Laurent Thierry. Edamora ends up not only having to do his dirty work from then on, but goes on a very fun, unbelievable adventures where he meets so many cool and interesting people. Now, I will not go into much detail on who Dorothy is and how she pertains to the plot for those who still want to watch the anime unspoiled. And you should, it's so good. I will say that she is of African descent. She has deep dark brown skin, blue eyes with neck length hair that she dyes into various colors. He's very much an extrovert, which is the complete opposite of me, charismatic and very confident. The Great Pretender is a very well done show with a great plot and just the music is mwah, chef's kiss. The Great Pretender is exclusively on Netflix. Now you might have noticed I skipped a certain someone back in 1992, and that is Sailor Pluto from Sailor Moon. Sailor Pluto, as you more than likely know, is from the anime Sailor Moon, and he is an outer planetary sailor scout, the daughter of Kronos, and is stationed to guard the door of space time. She is one of the stronger Sailor Scouts, being the daughter of a literal god. I believe power scaling wise, she is like the third or second strongest Sailor Scout, if we're excluding Galaxia here. As a human, her name is Setsuna Mio, and she is a university student who studies physics. She is also canonically the oldest of all the Sailor Scouts. Powers include the manipulation of space time, can teleport others over very large distances, has the ability to freeze time, although this is forbidden, and has a long list of attacks, including dead screen. Also another fun fact, she is a Scorpio like your girl. So shout out to my Scorpio fam. <laughs> now, the reason why I label Sailor Pluto as an honorable mention because Naoko Takeuchi said in one of her punch comic strips that she wanted to make Sailor Pluto a dark soldier. In doing so, she designed Sailor Pluto with darker hair and skin that was slightly darker than the other Sailor Scouts. Her design choice was more of an aesthetic choice than making a statement about her race. According to tuxedomask.com, 
Um, Takeuchi often ran into challenges filling in her hair and her skin when illustrating Sailor Pluto for the manga. Now, there are many sources who make statements and claims and theories about Sailor Pluto's race. Some claim that Setsuna Sailor Pluto is of Romani descent. Some say that she's Blasian, which means like black and Asian, or say that she's Southeast Asian, or perhaps that she is a part of an indigenous ethnic group in Japan that's known for having darker features. But in the absence of a definitive answer, it leaves Sailor Pluto's race up to the viewer's interpretation. Maybe Takeuchi wanted it that way. I think the lack of having that definitive answer is maybe Takeuchi's way of letting us interpret Sailor Pluto how we want to and how we see her. But what we do know is that Sailor Pluto slash Setsuna has darker skin than the other Sailor Scouts and that she is Japanese. Also, Pluto is a planet. Neil deGrasse Tyson, we have permanent beef. You have permanent beef with the Sailor Moon community. Pluto is a planet. Permanent beef. On site, bro. <laughs> now that was not only a long list of black girl representation in anime, but a pretty dope list. If I missed any of your faves, I am so sorry. Please put them down in the comments because of course I wanna hear about them. Now, as I mentioned before, it may not be a surprise to you that majority of these characters that I just mentioned and went over are not voiced by black women or dark skinned women when it comes to English dubbing. So I wanted to shed some light on some of my favorite black voice actresses. Aneris Quinones. I really hope I said your last name right, girl. I was researching and how to say it, and some people said it a little bit too fast for like my ears to pick up on, so if I mispronounced it, I am so sorry. I love you. <laughs> but some of Anaris' iconic roles include Hinatsuro from Demon Slayer, Yelena from Attack on Titan, and Miriko from My Hero Academia. Yo, she killed that role! She killed that role. I don't care what nobody say, she did that. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's Kimberly Ann Campbell. Most notable roles, Nagatoro from Don't Toy With Me, Miss Nagatoro, Nahida from Genshin Impact, and Argo and Sword Art Online Progressive. Then there's Anuka Akumo, who plays Lady Una in Mobile Suit Gundam Wing and Android 18 in Dragon Ball Z 1989. There's Laura Stoll, who plays Rey in The Promised Neverland and Dorothy from The Great Pretender. And then there's Danny Chambers, who plays Chisei Hatsuri in The Ancient Magus Bride, Becky Blackbell from Spy Family, and Lee Jo Hee from Solo Leveling. And also, if I can get permission, I wanna re-upload my interview that I did with Danny Chambers last year for the Boss Level podcast. It was such an honor to get to interview her and talk about magical girls. I was fangirling out and I actually got to take a picture with Danny. She is just so dope and super talented and check out everything that she's in, period. Moving on to Iona Morris, who was the amazing Claudia Grant from Robotech and also played Storm from X-Men in 1992 to 1994. And then there is the queen herself, Cree Summers, whose long resume needs no introductions, but some of my personal faves of hers are number five from Codename Kids Next Door, Susie Carmichael from Rugrats, and Princess Kita, Atlantis, The Lost Empire. It is so important to have black women represented in anime, not just on screen, but also in voice acting and production. I want to give all these voice actresses their flowers. Their work, visibility, and passion for the craft is so inspiring inspiring for me, but I'm sure for so many others like me. Honestly, these women have inspired me to want to go into voice acting. As the anime industry continues to evolve and become more mainstream and globalized, I think that there is space to include more characters of different backgrounds. Positive representation in media has the ability to humanize and make other cultures accessible. While individual preferences and opinions on representation may differ, and that is okay, it's always good to explore different anime titles to find what resonates with your interests. Black girl anime fans, we are out here. We have been out here the whole time. And I love sharing space with you all. Who is your favorite black girl in anime? Let me know down in the comments. If you like this content, consider giving me a five-star rating if you're listening to the podcast. And if you're watching on YouTube, give the video a like and remember to subscribe. Patrons and coffee mates get early access to episodes and bonus content. So if you'd like to join us over there, we welcome you. Thanks for your time. Remember to be kind and have a magical day. Bye. <laughs>